Today, I'll be talking about an important metabolic disorder of the pancreas called diabetes mellitus. Now, what is diabetes? It is nothing but a metabolic disorder characterized by hyperglycemia. It has two types, type 1 and 2. So, type 1 diabetes. It is considered to be a metabolic disorder characterized by hyperglycemia due to insulin deficiency. Here, it's considered to be a genetic disorder and it's associated with HLA, DR3 and 4. So what happens here? We have the autoimmune destruction of beta cells from the islet of Langerhans. It is an autoimmune reaction characterized by T lymphocytes attacking these beta cells. Hence, it's considered to be a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. And this usually presents in childhood itself because it's a genetic disorder and it's characterized by a couple of symptoms. Main ones being polyuria, since we have excess amounts of glucose in the blood, we need to excrete it in the form of urine. So there's also glyco Syria. Apart from that, since this glucose isn't uptaken by any of the muscle or fat cells because of a lack of insulin, we have characteristic polyphagia. Since there's the breakdown of fat, which is called lipolysis, as well as breakdown of protein in the muscles. And there would also be polydipsia, which is intense thirst. An important risk associated with hyperglycemia is diabetic ketoacidosis, wherein there's increasing number of ketone bodies being produced in the body and it could result in the free fatty acids from the lipolysis, lipolysis being converted into various substances like acetone, wherein we can detect it in the breath, characterized by like a fruity breath. Then there can also be acetoacetate as well as beta hydroxybutyrate. So this diabetic ketoacidosis, as the name suggests, increases the acidity of blood. Now this is associated with co cosmol acidotic respiration. So this is a compensatory mechanism which is characterized by deep or labored breathing and this is done to decrease the carbon dioxide levels in the blood which in turn reduces the acidity. Then there is also the resultant hyperkalemia. So for hyperkalemia what exactly happens is insulin is required to make sure that potassium stays inside cells. So when there is a lack of insulin, the potassium becomes or gets outside of the cells. So this results in increased blood K plus levels. And this results in the hyperkalemia. So this hyperkalemia is also associated with high anion gap metabolic acidosis due to a large difference in the measured ions. So this usually results from keto acid buildup. And going back to the hyperkalemia, we realized there's high K plus levels in the blood and this should be excreted. So this is excreted by the kidneys uh, along with some H plus ions because of the acidity. 
And in turn, what exactly happens is the body's uh, potassium levels actually decreases over time. And then during stress levels, which can be increased during infection or something, we have epinephrine release which results in glucagon release and this in turn can exacerbate, exacerbate the ketoacidosis as the ketone bodies are used as an alternative energy source and when glucose or glucagon is increased um, our blood um, in our blood there's going to be increased blood glucose And this results in loss of glucose in urine, resulting in the loss of water along with it, and this causes dehydration. Now, this glucagon is very important because it also exacerbates the amount of ketone bodies released because it's important in the lipolysis that occurs in the liver, which results in increased ketone bodies being produced. And the treatment would be, you need to treat the dehydration with some IV fluids, and maybe give the individual potassium, and of course the most important one, which is lifelong insulin. So next we have Type 2 diabetes. Now, type 2 diabetes is an end organ insulin resistance which leads to hyperglycemia. So, there could be a sufficient amount of insulin being secreted initially, but the peripheral um, organs or the tissues are unresponsive to the insulin. Here, the individual would be an obese middle-aged adult as these are the individuals that develop insulin resistance because their diet usually leads to a decreased number of insulin receptors and it's considered to have a strong genetic disposition as well so here what happens is the individual is at high risk for a specific condition called hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma wherein the high glucose levels can cause life-threatening diuresis with hypotension and coma as the name suggests. So, diabetes is associated with a lot of long-term consequences and this is usually because of the non-enzymatic glyco uh, glycosylation of blood vessels which can be like small, medium or large blood vessels. An important characteristic finding here would be certain glomerular lesions, specific one being Kimmel steel, Wilson nodules and as the name suggests it's a characteristic appearance of the glomerulus with characteristic ball-like matrix deposits and this can be uh, detected using the pass test uh, so it's pass positive another one that's important is a tubular lesion So this tubular lesion is called Armini-Epstein lesion, 
wherein there is glycogen being deposited in the proximal convoluted tubule. Then because of this hyperglycemic state, it can also affect Schwann cells, which can result in diabetic neuropathy, wherein the individual would have like paresthesias, usually of the leg, the lower extremities, as well as it can cause cataracts by affecting the lens, as well as blindness, since this hyperglycemic state can affect nerve cells adversely. Now, in the previously mentioned diabetic neuropathy, we have paresthesias which result in decreased sensation usually in the toes and fingers and this can be done in a stock and gloving distribution and with diabetic neuropathy we also have an extreme case wherein the individual would have a poor blood supply because of the non-enzymatic glycosylation as well as with the nerve damage causing ulcers. So in case if the ulcers get really bad, then the individual would have to amputate his or her limb. And it can also result in autonomic issues wherein the individual can be seen to be sweating quite excessively as well as having flatulence. So in the autonomic system dysfunctions, we could have examples like orthostatic hypotension could be there, the patient could have constipation, maybe some gastroparesis as well, there could be erectile dysfunction, etc, etc. So that's why it's very important to treat diabetes early on. To conclude, I would like to ask you guys a question. The glycosylated hemoglobin test measures the average blood glucose control of an individual over the previous three months. Which of the following values is considered a diagnosis of diabetes? Now, I'll give you guys a few seconds to think about the right answer from the options given. The right answer would be A, which is 6.5%. Now, in a diabetic, the normal percentage, or rather, in diabetics, the percentage would be 6.5% or above, which, if you would like the values in millimole per mole, it would be around 48 or more. Okay, now we have the next question, which is a clinical feature that distinguishes a hypoglycemic reaction from a ketoacidosis reaction is... Okay, the right answer here is going to be diaphoresis, wherein a hypoglycemic reaction results in the activation of fight or flight response in the body, which then triggers the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. And this results in activity in the autonomic nervous system, which is responsible for reactions that people can't control, such as sweating and digestion. The next one, or rather the last one, would be a client with a diagnosis of diabetic ketoacidosis is being treated in the ER. Which finding would you expect to note as of confirming this diagnosis? So we have the four options here. So the answer here is going to be A, which is elevated blood glucose levels. And in we can quite obviously see in diabetic acidosis or ketoacidosis, the arterial pH is going to be less than 7.35 and of note would be like low plasma bicarbonate levels as well. And the blood glucose levels here would be much higher than in the normal person as well as there could be ketone bodies being present as well in the blood and urine.